everybody. Thank you for joining us at the first online National Convention of Veterans for Peace and for this very special webinar, Resisting Nuclear War and Militarism in the Pacific. My name is Jerry Condon. I am the recent past president of Veterans for Peace and president of our Golden Rule Committee. I'm currently in Hawaii with the historic Golden Rule anti-nuclear sailboat, an international project of Veterans for Peace. I recognize that I am on land that was stolen from native Hawaiians by the United States. Co-facilitating with me is Helen Jackard, project manager of the Golden Rule. She's the one who keeps it all together. Helen will begin by giving us a brief history of the Golden Rule. Hi. In 1958, four Quaker peace activists sailed the Golden Rule from Los Angeles toward the Marshall Islands to interfere with nuclear bomb testing. They were stopped in Hawaii by the U.S. Coast Guard, arrested, and jailed. A U.S. family took the baton and, and sailed their boat, the Phoenix of Hiroshima, into the nuclear test zone. That captain was also arrested. The arrests of the crews brought international awareness to the problem of nuclear radiation, which was floating all over the globe, and brought about the limited nuclear test ban treaty of 1963. It also spawned the founding of Greenpeace, whose first boat sailed into a nuclear test zone near Alaska. Golden Rule was sold and disappeared from public view. In 2010, it sank in Northern California. Veterans for Peace decided to rebuild it and resume its anti-nuclear mission. For the last five years, we sailed Golden Rule up and down the coast of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, holding hundreds of events to educate people about the growing da dangers of nuclear war. In July 2019, one year ago, we sailed from San Diego to Hawaii. Our intention was to sail the to the original destination of the Golden Rule, the Marshall Islands, and continue all the way to Japan to be there this week to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the U.S. bombing of the civilian populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But alas, just as in 1958, the Golden Rule has so far been unable to sail beyond Hawaii, this time due to COVID-19. Aside from visiting the Marshall Islands, we intended to sail the Golden Rule to Guam and Okinawa on our way to Japan. Since we have been in Hawaii and also visited Guam, we have been learning a lot about the huge U.S. military presence throughout the Pacific. The U.S. military has essentially occupied Pacific Island nations ever since World War II, with grave consequences for the environment, for indigenous cultures, and for the sovereignty of these nations. The mission of the Golden Rule is therefore expanded. The growing danger of nuclear war is integrally connected with the destructive U.S. military presence throughout the Pacific. We are committed to lifting up the voices of the peoples of Hawaii, the Marshall Islands, Guam, and Okinawa, and we are very pleased to have very knowledgeable spokesperson with each of the, from each of these island nations with us today. From Hawaii, we have Kyle Kajahiro. From the Marshall Islands, we have Ariana Tibone and Milaika Andrique. From Guahan, we have Maria Hernandez. From Okinawa, we have Hideki Yoshikawa. We're gonna begin with Hawaii. Most people in the US think of Hawaii as the ultimate tropical vacation paradise. Very few people know of the huge U.S. military presence here and the devastation it has caused to the environment and to Native Hawaiian communities. But Kyle Kajahiro knows. He is one of the best informed people about the history and details of the U.S. military presence in Hawaii. Kyle Kajahiro is a lecturer at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and here in Honolulu in the departments of Ethnic Studies and Geography and Environment. He is a member of Hawaii Peace and Justice and a former staff person with the American Friends Service Committee Hawaii Area Program. He works with communities countering militarization in Hawaii and globally. Welcome, Kyle. Welcome, aloha. Hi, uh, Saigusio. Uh, 
half a day and aloha kako everyone um i want to thank jerry and helen for uh, and veterans for peace for inviting me us to uh come and share about the militarization and nuclear war uh, dangers in the pacific uh, and also thanks to my other panelists it's an honor to be here uh, and it's amazing that we can do this in real time all the way across uh, the planet so um this is exciting for me to be here with all of you. Um, just a little bit about myself first. Uh, I'm a fourth generation Nikkei, so I'm of Japanese descent in Hawaii. I'm not native Hawaiian, I just wanna make that clear. But uh, as a um, non-Kanaka Maoli working in Hawaii, in, in US occupied Hawaii, uh, I feel that you know, I have a kuleana or responsibility to address the, the um, injustice uh, and the history of dispossession and occupation by the US uh, military. And um, so for uh, about 15 years, I worked for the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, and one of the areas of programming that we did was to address, um, was demilitarization, was to look at the impacts of the military, uh, do research and education about those impacts, um, organize with local communities, and also build solidarity uh, internationally. Um, so let me just start by saying that in order to understand Hawaii's present situation, uh, you have to know the history of US imperial formation and militarization in this region. And conversely, uh, to know what the United States is in the world today, you have to understand the history of a place like Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii was and is a fulcrum of US imperial power in the Pacific. And it was a pivot from land power to sea power uh, it was the transit of empire from the manifest destiny and genocidal wars against Native Americans across the Pacific to the overseas colonies of the Philippines, Guahan, and Puerto Rico. Uh, but it's also a site that had a significant white settler presence, which became the, um, I guess, it, it was the basis for imagining a possible future for Hawaii to be assimilated into the United States. Uh, it was on the basis of settler colonialism that Hawaii became assimilable. And so uh, that's what kind of set our position apart, I think, from some of the other colonial relations and why we have these sort of gradations of sovereignty or dependency throughout our region. And Hawaii plays a role in sort of um, the imperial orchestration of these relations. A um, little bit of history. In 1872, um, General John Schofield and Colonel Burton Alexander uh, toured the islands disguised as tourists but they had secret orders to report back to Washington on um, suitable military locations for a military base. And so um, they, they came upon Kealvalao or Pu'uloa, what people now today know as Pearl Harbor. Uh, looking down, they saw the, the narrow channel, the deep uh, harbor, um, and already the wheels were turning in his head about uh, this could be uh, the key to the Central Pacific Ocean. And that's what he wrote back in his secret dispatches from Hawaii. Um, it was also, um, but what, what his um, correspondence obscured was the fact that these places were aina momona to the Native Hawaiians. They were fat, abundant lands, places of productivity. We had a lot of water that flows into this estuary where Native Hawaiians grew wet and dry land agriculture. And we had the most extensive uh, complex of aquacultural sites, uh, local ia or fish ponds. Um, and so this was the food basket of Oahu but um, from his gaze as the imperial kind of military, and all he saw was this military utility. The Native Hawaiian uses were completely irrelevant to him. And so uh, Pu'ulo uh, became the kind of the centerpiece of a controversy, the geopolitical controversy uh, for many years after that. In 1887, a group of um, Haole or white business um, owners and sugar planters conspired to uh, get a free trade agreement by offering Pu'uloa to the United States as ex exclusive um, treaty of reciprocity, which gave them uh, rights to build a coaling station in Pu'uloa. So this is the beginning of the dismemberment of Hawaii. Um, and it was secured also by um, a, a act of, um, I guess you'd call it a coup d'etat. Uh, the white settlers threatened violence against the king and said he had to sign a new treaty, a, a new constitution rather, which uh, disenfranchised the majority of Native Hawaiians because they did not meet the property requirements. Uh, it also transferred or concentrated power in the hands of the white minority. 
uh, and it barred Asian immigrants who were coming in to work on the sugar plantations uh, from having any uh, civil or political rights. Um, and so this was um, also a radical transformation which led, which led to a crisis in 1893 when US Marines landed to uh, support the overthrow of the queen. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of US military relation with Hawaii was a broken treaty, <clears throat> um, an act of war, um, and it's just grown and multiplied into these various manifestations. So as a result of that history, uh, today Hawaii has about 142 military sites, uh, from the, the largest being uh, the Pohakuloa training area, about 130,000 acres, to the small little outposts. Um, about 225,000 acres of land are controlled by the military, but that doesn't include all the airspace uh, and ocean space that it commands, uh, which includes all of the Hawaiian archipelago. Um, so this enables, this control of Hawaii enables the United States to um, project power and to control vast areas of the Pacific. Um, so one of the metaphors that uh, Hawaiian scholar Kalei Kua'ka'eo coined to describe the military in Hawaii, he said, um, Hawaii is like the head of a monstrous he'e or octopus. So the military in Hawaii has its head in Hawaii and the, the uh, tentacles are stretched out across the Pacific, um, holding on to the Marshall Islands, to Guahan, to Okinawa, the Philippines, Australia, um, numerous other places. Uh, the brains of this he'e are um, symbolized by the uh, US Indo-Pacific Command, which is headquarters uh, here in, in Honolulu, um, at, with its supercomputers and uh, fiber optics as a nervous system. Uh, the eyes of this he'e are on top of our mountaintops with the radar and uh, various kinds of tracking stations. Um, we have uh, the ears of this octopus are underwater tracking stations off of um, on the ocean floor off of Kauai. Uh, the listening posts for the um, Navy communications um, computer and telecommunications master center and also the NSA National Security Agency has a, a spy post here in Hawaii where they're scooping up all of our electronic communications and the the excrement or the waste of this uh, giant uh, octopus uh, can be symbolized by the thousands of contaminated sites throughout the islands. You know, everything from um, uh, unexploded ordnance to uh, cancer causing agents to giant spills of petroleum and jet fuel which threaten our drinking water. So, and the thing about octopus, if you, if you cut off the tentacle of a live octopus, it grows back. And we see that that's what's happening in the Philippines. The, they, the movement there uh, expelled the US bases uh, but um, slowly that has grown back with uh, advisors going into Mindanao and now expanded military presence uh, to counter uh, China in the South um, China Sea. So uh, we see that Hawaii plays this role in order to deal with this problem that's affecting our region. I think we have to also deal with the fact that Hawaii remains this kind of military hub uh, which affects our neighbors and our brothers and sisters. Uh, there's been a history of resistance, however, uh, one of them, the most notable being the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana, which arose in the 1970s to um, uh, protect the island of Kaho'olawe from Navy bombing. And this was an island that was written off as lost cause, as de destroyed, uh, but it was also a sacred place for Native Hawaiians and uh, symbolic of the, the god Kanaloa, which represents the whole uh, vast Pacific Ocean. So they were successful in 1990 in stopping uh, the Navy bombing, a small you know, movement of Hawaiians, but uh, with allies uh, throughout Hawaii and around the world, uh, working with the nuclear free and independent Pacific, they were able to block uh, um, training uh, from other countries, bombing. Uh, we also have the movement to stop the uh, military use of Makua Valley on Oahu, and that's been going on now since the 70s. And we've stopped training for the last uh, 14, 15 years now through legal action and political pressure. Uh, Pohakulo on Hawaii Island is one of the largest areas and it's absorbing most of the military training. So we are supporting folks on that island uh, in their efforts to stop the bombing. Um, and then there's expanded missile defense uh, radar and um, missile launch facilities that are threatening to uh, be built. Um, the, the, the geopolitical tension with North Korea is giving the excuse for building up these uh, facilities. Uh, but we see them as making us a target um, in these uh, you know, provocations that the United States is making. Uh, and right now, the, the threat that we're trying to stop, we have a coalition called the Cancel RIMPAC Coalition. So RIMPAC stands for the RIM of the Pacific uh, uh, Training Exercise. It's the largest multinational naval exercise in the world. 
Um, in 2018, uh, the, the uh, RIMPAC included 26 countries, uh, hundreds uh, of uh, aircraft, uh, ships, um, about 25,000 um, sailors from all over the region. Uh, they did air, land, and sea um, training, including amphibious assault. Uh, and so it has tremendous impacts on the land, on sacred sites. Um, and, you know, it's just, um, it's a way of the United States uh, developing its hegemony over this region by organizing other countries into its sort of vision of, of security and order. Uh, and it's aimed primarily at countering China's rise, so, to some extent Russia and also North Korea, but mainly China. Um, so the military though is, is also one of the worst um, uh, incubators of the COVID-19 uh, virus. And we, we will probably hear some of that in Guahan and Okinawa, but here in Hawaii, we also have many cases. They're not giving us information, uh, very little leaks out, but we do know that one of the zip code hotspots uh, for COVID-19 sits right on uh, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. And so um, we've been organizing to try to get them to cancel RIMPAC. We've gotten quite a bit of support from um, in Hawaii and around the world. We have a petition, but uh, the Navy is intent on having a scaled down version of it. They plan to do uh, what they call at sea training only, uh, where only 10 countries looks like will be participating. Um, but uh, they gave us assurances early that there would be no onshore so social activities uh, and the Department of Defense had a restriction of movement order in place. Uh, the state of Hawaii also had a 14 day quarantine order. Uh, the state exempted the military and their per dependents from the uh, quarantine. And then recently the Department of Defense lifted their restriction of movement for Hawaii. Uh, so we don't know what that means in terms of um, uh, social activities, liberty ashore. We, um, we're we expecting the worst that, that there'll be um, a flood of foreign sailors uh, coming ashore, looking to have fun on the beaches, going into Waikiki. And one of the things that always happens with these trainings is it becomes a hotbed for sex trafficking. Uh, the pimps bring in women from all over because there's gonna be customers. Um, and so that's something the Commission on the Status of Women has been um, organizing and doing a campaign against that. Um, but I'll end on one uh, uh, hopeful note that um, because of the COVID-19, we've seen uh, the beaches have been much quieter Locals can go back to the beach and not have to fight with tourists for parking or beach space. Um, we've seen uh, the, the fish and, and um, plant life uh, recovering. So nature is sort of to, starting to uh, return. Uh, and on the beach at Waimanalo, which is uh, at the Bellows Air Force Station, where the Marines would normally be doing amphibious training right now during RIMPAC, um, the, uh, they've had reports of Honu, or green sea turtles uh, nesting for the first time in recorded history. So um, we took that as a Hawaii lona or a good omen uh, that nature is trying to reclaim this place and we need to support that. Uh, the honu is a symbol of Kanaloa, the god of the sea. So we see that as also a symbol of connecting us to the rest of Oceania and all of our struggles and aspirations for freedom and for protecting our, our um, islands and our oceans. So mahalo. Thank you very much, Kyle. That was really interesting and I and just goes to the other with everything that I've been learning while I've been here for the last year. From 1946 to 1958 the US military dropped 67 nuclear bombs on the Marshall Islands including the Castle Bravo bomb which was 1,000 times more powerful than the nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The resulting devastation in the Marshall Islands continues to this very day. I'm happy to welcome two Marshallese women to share with us their continuing struggle for the health of their people in the face of the terrible nuclear legacy. Ariana Tabone is the Republic of the Marshall Islands National Nuclear Commission Public Education and Awareness Director. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and currently resides in Majuro where she works with students and youth to encourage engagement in nuclear dialogue. Ariana is a descendant of survivors of the catastrophic Bravo shot that was detonated in the Marshall Islands March 1st, 1954. She is a strong advocate for nuclear justice and she teaches in nuclear issues in the Pacific course at the College of the Marshall Islands. 
Malika Andrique is a Marshallese student currently working on her bachelor's degree in medical anthropology and global health at the University of Washington. She is also interning for the National Nuclear Commission, focusing on connecting with different student groups to uplift social health and global issues centered around nuclear testing. Welcome Ariana and Malaika. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry and Helen and Colleen for coordinating this webinar. And um, this is Ariana. Malika, can you say hi? <laughs> so we prepared a presentation for our webinar today and we initially had more than 30 slides and then when we did our practice we went over 15 minutes so we're going to try our best to stay within 15 minutes um, so i'm just going to share my screen okay so as um helen mentioned we work for the rmi national nuclear commission the three pictured here are the commissioners and we the commission was established in February 28, 2017 and the core mandate is to coordinate government's needs to address ongoing unresolved issues and challenges arising from the US nuclear testing and that it and that we're because right now all the information or most of the information that we have is coming from the DOE Department of Energy and the NNC's um, goal is to ensure that you know, national we have national capacity and that all of our information is nationally owned and nationally stored instead of just always referring back to DOE information, DOE studies. And so this is a map of the Marshall Islands. We just wanted to put it out there that we are very scattered, but we all speak the same language and we all, um, we all have the same culture. And just for visuals, this is what each atoll looks like, or this is what one atoll looks like. The picture on the right is Madro, that's the capital city, that's where I'm located. And then the top left, you see a picture of the houses there, that's, that's called Eji Island. And that is where some of the people of Bikini now reside, currently reside because of the on the contamination in their home. And then the picture down below is just a few more islands that are a part of Madro. And so before we proceed with the um, health effects of nuclear contamination, I will let Malika speak, oh, sorry. <laughs> before Malika speaks about environmental impacts, we just wanted to put some background. Um, in 1947, the United Nations established the trust territory of the Pacific Islands, as I'm sure you all are already aware of. And we wanted to highlight that one of the main responsibilities of the United States with these um, trust territories was to protect the inhabitants against the loss of their lands and resources. And this whole webinar just totally goes all against that because instead of protecting the people and their lands and resources, they ruined us. And so from 1946 to 1958, the Marshall Islands along with um, Johnston and Christmas Island were labeled Pacific Proving Grounds. And throughout the span of 12 years where 67 nuclear tests were tested in Bikini and Enoetak, there was 23 tests in Bikini Atoll, 43 in Enoetak. Um, there was a lot of movement going on. They had to relocate the people from Bikini to Rongrik and then to Rongrik to Ujilang and then Ujilang, Kwajalein, Kwajalein, Kili. And then you see the pictures here, the top right picture. I wanted to put that there because this is when the people of Bikini first arrived in Rongrik in 1946 when they were first relocated. And they were there for two years and Throughout the span of two years, they experienced extreme famine because they were left with not enough food supply and the atoll that they were relocated to was initially uninhabited because there's just not enough food resources and most of the fish around this atoll are cicatera fish and so they weren't able to consume the fish. <sighs> I'm sorry. Okay, we'll go to environmental impacts. I wish we had like five hours each to speak, but... <laughs> Malika, go ahead. 
Okay, um, so environmental impacts. So radiation knows no boundary and some of the earliest signs of uh, radiation poisoning was um, on top of skin diseases and rashes. It was with through the crops and some of the food that people from the Marshall Islands were eating. So it was the seafood, the coconuts, uh, arrowroot, which is actually not able to grow again ever since uh, the nuclear testing. And through like the impacts of crops, usage of land was deteriorating for weaving is really important to the people of the Marshall Islands. We use the land to make our homes, um, the canoes to fish for food. And um, it also ruined the native diet and introduced to the people of the Marshall Islands processed food and canned foods through the US. And I think that was also the introduction of some of the diseases like um, diabetes as well. Another impact was on medicine, the use of some of the agriculture to um, just the native uh, healing for medicine. Also proper burial sometime when people were moving from island to island, they also um, moved a lot of the um, ancestors. And I think that was also um, what brought out a lot of the radiation poisoning because they were reopening the dirt and some of that air was plutonium air. And this section right here where I had set up, I wanted to do like a domino effect, but I couldn't, I didn't know how to do it. But basically <laughs> the whole design of it is a connection of colonialism, nuclear testing, COVID treaty and climate change. I think they're all topics that you can't really speak about separately because they're all interconnected and interconnected with militarism in the Pacific Ocean. Um, so this point right here where land over money, a lot of compensation, the US thinks they can just use the money to compensate for lost land and resources, but um, land is very important to the um, Marshallese because it's passed down through generation through our matrilineal lineage and um, yeah, so it's generational and um, just the idea that the Marshall Islands went through, they were a war zone, a testing ground and currently a testing ground as well and also a dump site. People from Bikini and Ronglup, they're not able to go home and so they are forced to relocate uh, to poverty and some people even uh, migrate over to the U.S. but even when coming to the U.S. we struggle with health care and yeah that's it for me. So as was mentioned earlier, Operation Castle Bravo, it was detonated on March 1st, 1954 at 6.45 a.m. And although the United States claimed this as an accidental design error, the people of the Marshall Islands, as well as our government, have every right to believe that this was not an accident. In fact, because weather reports on the eve of March 1st indicated that the winds were blowing towards the people. And there, there is, there is, there's declassified files and in one of the files, there's meeting minutes of a meeting that took place in 1953, which, is, which was a year before this. And this meeting minute specifically notes that, because they were doing all these projects and then one of them was the was supposed to be the bio, biomedical study of radiation on mice. And so we believe that detonating the Bravo shot that would then be um, affecting the rest of the islands was planned so that they would change Project 4.1 from the biomedical study of um, radiation on mice to biomedical study of radiation on human beings. And so, as was also mentioned before, the Bravo shot was a thousand times stronger than both Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, bombs combined. And it surprised many islets and contaminated most of RMI, especially Rongalap and Wudurug Atolls. And, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that 
then the cloud had we had a thousand feet and I haven't been on an airplane since 2008 but I believe the cruising altitude is 30,000 feet and it does not take it takes a few minutes to pilot climb up 30,000 feet anyways um what after the Bravo shot on March 1st, the people were not evacuated till March 4th. There was actually a ship that was anchored on the lagoon of one of these atolls that was ordered to sail away after reporting back to command that the fallout had arrived at this specific atoll, and this is Ronald Atoll. And so on March 4th, when they came to evacuate the people of Rongalap and Wudruk, they were already covered in burns. The people for most of those that duration, they weren't able to move. They were feeling very nauseous. Their nails had fallen off. Some started to develop black stripes under their fingernails. Their hair was already falling off and they just didn't understand what was going on. In most of these islands, these communities, not many people were able to get up and walk around. And so we're told that it was only a few strong men who were able to go from house to house to provide coconut drinks because they couldn't drink the water from the catchments because they had already turned yellow. Anyways, on March 4th, when they boarded the ship to be evacuated to Kwajalein where Project 4.1 was to commence, the, the communities were ordered to strip down. And so they stood on the ships without clothing and they were hosed down. And then they were given small towels to cover themselves and then soldiers underwear and t-shirts to wear for the journey from their home to Kwajalein. So on March 9th, Project 4.1 scientists arrived on Kwajalein and then Project 4.1 um, officially started on March 11th, 1954. And then, oops. So they were, they were used as human subjects, as I mentioned before. Upon arrival in Kwajalein Atoll, they lived in a fenced off area that was prepared for them. And it was only doctors and police that were allowed. They were taking urine and blood tests daily, um, blood samples daily. And throughout this whole time, it was not just the exposed community that was on Kwajalein. They also brought in a control group and that was people from Madro and other atolls that did not experience the fallout. But this control group was meant to be there so that they could either inject them with radiation or have them ingest radiation. And their testimony said that sometimes they would take blood, mix it with something and then draw and then um, inject the blood back into them. And then other survivors mentioned of experience where they mixed um, something in pow a powder in fruit punch and then had them drink it. And it's, it shows in the United States declassified files, all the different effects of being injected with radiation, ingesting radiation and being exposed to radiation. And so throughout this time that they were there, um, it varied for each atoll. Um, they had to bathe three times a day. They had to scrub their um, burns with soap in the salt water because they were bathing in the lagoon. And then <clears throat> the other subjects that were included were chicken, pig, sheep, mice. And throughout this whole process, the United States researchers did not obtain informed consent from any of the people, whether it was the exposed group or the control group. And we just wanted to put out on here the um, purposes as documented in the Project 4.1 final report. They wanted to document and treat immediate effects from radiation exposure. They wanted to document population and control, control groups in ways that set a baseline. And this was all four points come straight from the Project 4.1 um, proposal. They wanted to obtain samples, measurements, and biological responses. And then last but not least, they wanted to provide information to ongoing studies on absorption rates, oops, sorry, elimination processes, and other questions of interest to the national security and military defense of the United States. And so, as you see um, the book here, it shows um, the year on the right, those numbers, it's 1967, but each person was assigned a clinic number. So if, if a woman was pregnant, she would 
for example, she would be project 4.1 patient number 24, and then the child in her womb would be patient number 25. So even before a person is born, while they're pregnant during that Bravo shot, they were already um, being tested. <clears throat> and so th this is a photo of the children that were on Kwajalein. By then, all their hair had fallen off. They had already started to develop thyroid problems and <clears throat> Throughout the years, various cancers started to arise, and there's a list of more than 26 cancers that are deemed um, caused by radiation under the Nuclear Claims Tribunal. And there was a warning that people should no longer be exposed to radiation for at least 20, 20, 12 years, but the United States disregarded that and returned the people to their to return the people to their communities or their highly contaminated homes. And so we also wanted to highlight that some of the some of the things that the scientists wanted to study under Project 4.1 was how radiation affects the teeth and how radiation affects bone marrow. And that's just because they would just go to the communities and take samples. They would either draw blood or in some cases they get from and especially to the little children and so you, you can just see how inhumane this was um and so that's called Yangtangur. that was the ship that visited these atolls once a year to take samples and there was still births miscarriages jellyfish babies and a long list of diseases resulting from radiation also least tested had radiation induced blood disorders and so um, right now the people of Bikini and Rongalab are not living in Bikini and Rongalab they are still living in exile in different islands throughout the Marshall Islands the people of Wudruk were returned home after three months and they've been home in Wudruk Atoll till today um, these are photos of when the people of Rongalab were returned to Rongalap in 1957. And you can see over here, when they would move, they dug up the graves to take their um, loved ones with them. And so over this picture at the top right is a picture of a movie night that they were having on the ship. And they would say like, you know, during these movie nights, they would just play war movies that kind of showed, you know, American power and the weapons that they had. And so it's just really, crazy, interesting stuff. Um, <clears throat> life after 1954, when they had returned to their home atolls, there was already science lab set up there and they took these, um, um, they still monitored the people annually. And for the people of Rongalap, they lived in Rongalap for 28 years until they started to realize there something was not right. And there was something going on that, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't see this. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, I think I have like one more minute or maybe I've exceeded my minute, but these are just pictures of some of the children and the effects of radiation on the people. And we, we used to have a lot of photos, but those were all burned down along with a lot of files or charts at the hospitals. They were also burned. And so right now we don't have much because everything was burned through, there was fires set between um, times. And anyways, <laughs> I think um, we'll just stop here. And so we wanted to highlight that the compact was negotiated in 1986, but it was not until 1993 that a lot of declassified files were finally released to the Marshall Islands. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Ariana and Malika. It's really hard to hear what uh, your people have had to endure. Um, I really don't know what to say, um, but uh, we hope to uh, that more people in the US and around the world will come to be educated about this and be in solidarity with uh, the people of the Marshall Islands going forward. Um, I understand that uh, the uh, 
uh, some of the radiation from the tests in the Marshall Islands actually drifted all the way over to Guam, Wahan, and uh, there's an uh, impact there as well. I know many people in, in the US and around the world heard about Guam recently when the captain of the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt, which was docked there in Guahan, uh, was fired after publicly calling for responsible measures to reduce COVID-19 infections among his sailors. And this was a real problem for the people of Guam as well. The US military occupies a good portion of the island. And when the US Navy sneezes, the people of Guam catch a cold. So we are very pleased today to have Maria Hernandez with us. Maria Hernandez is the daughter, a daughter of Wahan and environmental and cultural rights advocate with a BA in literature and MS in business administration. She is a member of Direct Action Environmental and Cultural Adv Advocacy Organization, Putehi Litkizan, uh, Save Rit Ritidian, or PLSR. PLSR aligns with organizations throughout the Marianas to end the desecration and militarization of indigenous lands. Maria is also a member of indigenous women-led nonprofit Ihagan Famalawan Wahan, Daughters of the Women of Guam, which advocates for the social, economic, cultural, spiritual, and political well-being of Chamorro women, girls, and gender diverse people of Wahan. Uh, welcome, Maria. Thank you to the Veterans for Peace organization uh, for organizing this webinar and all activists presenting alongside me today. I'm so grateful to connect with you all to learn more about our collective struggles and to share some of the issues we face here on Guam. So I wanted to provide a brief overview of the current militari militarization of Guam. The island of Guam is about 212 square miles. About one third of our land is occupied by the US military. Here we have an Air Force base and a Naval base, a base that houses a Naval hospital. And these are located throughout the Northern Central and Southern parts of the island. So there's a lot of visible military presence here. Um, as military buildup projects move forward, our region is being transformed into the largest military industrial complex in the world. The Mariana Islands training and testing region spans over close to 84 million acres of open ocean around the Marianas. This is larger than Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, Montana, and New Mexico combined. And our group is among a handful of others, uh, including Guardians of Ghani, Pagan Watch, Tinian Women's Association, and Alternative Zero Coalition, to name a few, who are fighting this harmful designation and this environmental racism. Despite over a decade-long resistance to the relocation of Marines from Okinawa to Guahan, our island has seen an increase uh, in construction including another large base, a marine base, um, that will, is, it's uh, proposed to accommodate approximately 5,000 Marines and their families from Okinawa to Guam. And our community recently learned that in the, in the construction of this base, the military had cleared three cultural heritage sites that before being cleared were eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And we're currently in the process of organizing against this action. The comment period for these construction projects came after the sites were already cleared and the largest ancient settlement cleared was as big as 12 football fields in size. As part of this military buildup, the DOD is also building a massive U.S. Marine live fire training range in northern Guam above our northern lens aquifer, which provides 80 to 90 percent of our um, drinking water and uh, desecrating many cultural sites and destroying thousands of acres of limestone forest, which is uh, home to endangered endemic species. There are so many human rights violations occurring all at once for this project. And uh, we actually had a very small victory yesterday, 10 months after Pritahila Texan uh, requested that local officials take action and invoke a stipulation to pause military construction uh, due to impacts to cultural and environmental resources 
Uh, we received news yesterday that our state historic preservation officer finally invoked the stipulation and there's now a, for the next 45 days, a pause on military construction to reevaluate impacts and to find a resolution. So yeah, it's just uh, definitely, as I mentioned, a small victory, but we're continuing to stay vigilant and um, kind of be watchdogs on, on this issue. As is evidence, Wuhan is hyper-militarized. It's a, a um, you just see military presence everywhere here. And because of our political status as an unincorporated US ter territory, we have very limited power when it comes to making decisions regarding the military's presence on our island. Um, and, you know, as, as a few of you mentioned, this has been the case, uh, and it's been especially obvious during the pandemic. Um, and, I, and I see a lot of parallels in, in what, you know, was happening in Hawaii. And um, we, were, we were kind of experience, exper experiencing similar things here. Uh, we were learning about the pandemic from national news sources instead of, of our local news agencies because the Department of Defense is very tight-lipped with information and transparency is a major issue on their part. We were learning of airmen commuting to and from work within their 14-day quarantine on national news sites, and there just wasn't a mandate to quarantine in place, so they were pretty much moving freely. And we were hearing, as, as Kyle mentioned, that Hawaii was experiencing, um, the military was, was basically exempt from being quarantined for 14 days. And as um, Jerry had mentioned, the, the uh, outbreak on the USS Theodore Roosevelt made national news. Um, more than 500 Roosevelt sailors from the crew of nearly 5,000 tested positive for coronavirus and they docked on Guam to receive care. So this was definitely concerning for many of our community members. Um, outside the fence, we knew that it would put our community members directly at risk. So there were uh, more than a handful of local advocacy organizations who wrote to our governor and we expressed concerns that, you know, we, we understood that they needed to receive care, but we just asked that they do so on the basis away from the community because we have a large elderly population and an at-risk population. So. Um, despite that request, the military reached an agreement with our governor to instead house them in hotels in the central village of Tuman around the community. And it was just a jarring time because, um, as I mentioned, Joint Region Marianas was providing very limited information to our community. And we were finding out the number of positive cases and learning what about learning about what was happening on our island and down the street on national media. Um, and connecting all of this to RIMPAC, um, we had to consider what happened with the USS Roosevelt, the outbreak on the ship, and the need for sailors to be treated off the ship, as this should be very alarming for Hawaii, Guam, and anywhere they might be docking during these exercises. Although the military is currently proposing only training for its RIMPAC exercises this year at sea, Guam is one of the safe haven sites for naval ships and sailors, and there is potential that an outbreak could occur on these large sea vessels and that they would be required to dock at the nearest ports, which would put our community at, at further risk. Um, in addition to the US S. Roosevelt situation, there, there have been increased naval trainings with little warning provided to the community. And these trainings are dangerous to our community because they occur on civilian lands and in waters where our local fishermen fish for sustenance. They're also happening too frequently and bring bring issues, um, bring up issues with the lack of transparency, the contamination of our lands and waters and our food source, the safety of our community. And, and these are all struggles that we share similarly with, um, with you know, other activists speaking today about RIMPAC exercises. So Guam is currently in the process of uh, pushing toward um, decolonization this is one of the solutions that we see as um, kind of being the underlying, um, this is kind of like the hurdle that we face is our political status. So um, we are 
you know, a colony, we're a mod modern day colony. And so this hinders us from having a real say about issues on our island. Uh, we're one of 17 colonies that exist in the world and we've been colonized for more than 300 years. And because of this, we've lost so many special parts of our heritage to outside influence and forced assimilation. Many of our elders were punished for speaking our language. So, you know, the sad reality is that in present day, most of us in my generation don't even speak our language. And we're working toward language revitalization um, by teaching our children. Um, but, you know, there are obviously, there are obvious hurdles um, picking up a language at an older age. But, you know, um, me and many of my friends were, were working at it. Um, and these are just the consequences of colonialism that we face every single day as we continue on as a colony. So just the, the, um, the current landscape of resistance on Guam, there are about 35 local community organizations who continue to call for transparency and accountability on military issues. Uh, and we always are um, joining forces with allies within the region or in other parts of the world in protection of sacred indigenous spaces. So, you know, all of all of the speakers here today at this webinar, we would love to con connect with you further and we all have each other's emails. So, you know, if, if you need assistance in raising awareness, we're 100% we're, um, behind you and, and we'll support you. And um, lastly, as we all know, we share similar struggles to militarization in our own communities and my hope is that we'll continue to all work together in spaces like these across our lands and oceans to continue outreach, connect, and raise awareness about the ways U.S. militarization impacts our communities. Um, we have uh, just a call to action uh, petition for um, people to sign on our social media pages. Um, I'm part of two organizations, um, but the one that um, the petition is for is to stop the firing range complex in northern Guam, which impacts environmental cultural resources. And the scariest part is our, our main water source, which provides um, clean drinking water for our island. So um, please follow us. And we are will definitely hope to exchange um, information with you all about your um, about your social media handles so we can follow your causes as well. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share our collective struggles. Thank you, Maria. That was very enlightening. And I'm sure that all of us will want to take you up on your offer to, uh, to stay in touch and to network and build solidarity together. Um, so next we're going to talk about Okinawa. Veterans for Peace is uh, somewhat knowledgeable about Okinawa and the huge U.S. military presence there. Uh, VFP members in the U.S. have visited Okinawa and participated in huge ongoing community resistance to the expansion of U.S. bases there. There's even a Veterans for Peace chapter in Okinawa, which includes both U.S. and Okinawan veterans, and they have been attending uh, the VFP conventions in the U.S. for the last several years. I imagine that some of them are online with us for our first online convention. So we are very pleased to have a leading Okinawan expert and activist with us today. Um, and that he is Hideki Yoshikawa. Hideki Yoshikawa is a native of Okinawa and a cultural and applied anthropologist teaching at Mayo University and the University of Ryukyus in Okinawa, Japan. He is the international director of the Save the Dugong Campaign Center and the director of the Okinawa Environmental Justice Project. Over the last decades, he's been on the forefront of internationalizing Okinawa's struggle against the overwhelming presence of U.S. military bases on his native island from the perspective of environmental protection and environmental rights. Welcome, Hideki. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kideki Yoshikawa, and uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity. I'm really honored to join this uh, wonderful uh, session. And uh, my appreciation goes to Jerry 
and the other members of our VFP who organized this uh, wonderful workshop. I'm also excited to have this uh, opportunity to discuss with my uh, Pacific partners uh, who have been struggling uh, against the uh, militarizations in their own uh, regions. And uh, I'm really excited to share with you our stories of resisting militarism uh, in Okinawa and also in the Pacific. Um, as you can see on my uh, PowerPoint, my presentation is titled Okinawa Resisting Militarism and the Dual Colonialism. Uh, I use the dual colonialism because I believe that Okinawa has been colonized by two superpowers. One is Japan and the other is US, United States. The militarization of Okinawa has been only possible because of this dual colonization of Okinawa. So resisting militarism also means resisting this dual colonialism. I want to start with the, uh, this map of the Pacific. And uh, you can see the, uh, where the Okinawa is located. It's kind of hard to see but it's, uh, in this <laughs> map, small dots. But as you can see the location of Okinawa, this is located, uh, Okinawa Islands are located in the south of the Japanese main islands. And then next to China, and across to Taiwan, and it's a gateway to, and to the Southeast Asian countries. And this geography of Okinawa has been used as a great excuse for Japan and the US to militarize Okinawa since the World War II and until the present. But when you look at, take a close look at the um, Okinawa, uh, you can see many wonderful things as well. As our presenters uh, show uh, the pictures of their, their islands, Okinawa is also uh, rich in uh, nature and uh, we have a very cultural, rich cultural traditions. Today, Okinawa is uh, Japan's southernmost prefecture. We have like 160 small islands and 46 of them were inhabited. And we have like 1.4 million people living in Okinawa. And a majority of them are native Okinawans like myself. But we have the Japanese people also living here, uh, living in Okinawa, and uh, people with uh, mixed ethnicities um, also live there. And we have US military personnel also living in this island. So, Okinawa has a proud of history, uh, proud of history of having a peaceful, it's our own kingdom. But in the late um, 19, uh, 1879, the Okinawa or the Ryukyu Kingdom was subjugated to the, to the Meiji uh, Imperial Japan and it became part of the Japan. Now I wanna show you this, uh, num these numbers. These numbers indicate how militarized Okinawa is in comparison, especially in comparison with the mainland Japan. So Okinawa accounts for 0.6% of the total land mass of Japan but 70% of US military bases that is exclusively used. US military bases, 70% of US military bases in Japan is concentrated in Okinawa. And we have like 31 US military bases and the facilities. And 8% of the total area of Okinawa is occupied by US military. And 50% uh, of total area of Okinawa Island, which I live on, and uh, you can see the map of Okinawa Island on, the, on your left. So 50% of the, uh, this island is occupied by US military. And uh, when we're speaking about militarizations, uh, 
uh, in Okinawa, we have to also pay attention to militarization by Japanese self-defense forces. Although this map doesn't show, uh, but we have a self-defense forces in Okinawa. And uh, they are also expanding in the southern islands of like uh, Ishigaki and uh, Miyako Islands. So from an Okinawan perspective, this is just overwhelming presence of US military bases in our small islands. And uh, we believe this is an unfair burden. Japan's got Japanese government, they'll always say the national security and the US and Japan uh, security alliance is so important. And that's why they say they need to have a US military presence in Japan. But from the Okinawan perspective, This is just unjust, unfair burden that Okinawan has to share. And why does not the rest of Japan share the burden? This is one of the questions many Okinawans, regardless of their political orientations, would like to have an answer for. Now I wanna move on to um, impact of bases. And uh, there are so many bases, but I wanna focus on two uh, major bases. Actually, one uh, is in the U.S. Marine Corps Femmer Air Stations located in the middle of Ginoan City. As you can see, it's actually in the middle of urban area. And the other uh, base I will talk about is the base now is under constructions in Henoko, Ora Bay, in Nago, Nago City. That's where I live. As you can see, the Ftema Air Base is located in the middle of the big city, crowded city. And uh, maybe you can see this, there's uh, schools, hospitals, uh, kindergartens. So this air base really occupies in the middle of this city. Fema Air Stations and its impact on the local communities. There are many impacts uh, or many issues we have with the Fema Air Stations. Uh, first of all, noise pollution from US uh, military aircraft flying over the local communities. As you can see on the uh, picture in the uh, upper left, every day we have aircrafts taking off, landing, taking off, landing uh, in the middle of the city. And there's been lawsuits against the, uh, this aircraft's uh, FEMA uh, noise pollution. We have these lawsuits, but uh, local plaintiffs never been successful actually. And uh, we, uh, we also have this uh, danger of aircraft crashes and the dropping of object from US military craft flying over the middle of the city. And as you can see on the, the photo on the um, bottom right, this is a scene from the uh, uh, hel hel helicopter crash that took place in 2004. Helicopter crashed in the Okinawa International University. Luckily, nobody was injured but this, that local communities always have to worry about this danger or the possibilities of aircraft crashing down on you. And at that time when the, uh, uh, this helicopter crash took place, the local government and even the local police were not allowed to the site. To, they, they were denied access to the, this crashing site. So that there was no local investigations. Uh, so the US military took over the uh, area and they did uh, their own investigations. Then after that, then local police were allowed to do their uh, own investigation. 
and another problems or impacts of the Tenma air station on local communities is the contamination of land and water with the PFOS and the PFAS uh, dioxins, uh, many other chemicals from, uh, from Tenma air stations. And as you can see on the left side, the upper left, this is the uh, uh, fire extinguisher foam released from or leaked from the Ftema air station. Uh, they took place uh, a few months ago and then it was the local government and the local um, government that had to clean up this uh, mess. US military is not responsible for clean up people's contaminated form outside the, back, uh, the military base. And also, as uh, many of you already uh, talked about, we are facing this uh, issues of a spread of COVID-19 on US bases. As of yesterday, uh, we have like 245 US military personnel have been identified as uh, infected. But again, just like many, um, just like the, the other panels discussed, the Okinawan government doesn't have access to information on the COVID-19 on the basis. So we are always struggling to get information from the military basis. So militarism under dual colonialism. Means not only that militarization and its impact or impact imposed upon the local communities, but it also means that no government or US military or Japanese government takes responsible responsibility for the impacts that local people suffered. Now let's move on to another big base issue here. This is the uh, construction site at the Henoko Ora Bay. This is actually um, constructions uh, is underway for almost six years. And this is a uh, Femma, it's called a, officially called a FEMA re replacement facility because as you see it here, Okinawan people demanded the closure of a FEMA base. And uh, after the uh, 1995 uh, horrible rape incidents uh, of a 12 year girl by three US military personnel. After this horrible incident, the Okinawan people uh, got very angry and uh, demanded uh, reductions or reducing of the US pre uh, military presence. And the Japanese government and the U US government, they've discussed and they decided to close the military base, this uh, FEMA air stations. But they had a condition. The condition was that they'll build a new base or replacement facility within Okinawa. So this is what's happening now in uh, Henoko Ura Bay. This area is one of the most richest biodiversity areas in Japan. You will see like a 50, uh, 5,300 uh, marine species, including 262 endangered species. And uh, maybe that these numbers are uh, kind of hard to uh, understand, but I will give some uh, interesting comparison. And the value and the wonder of this uh, biodiversity in Henoko Urabe is comparable to the, those of the uh, Hawaii's Marine National Monument. 
Hawaii's National Monument, Marine National Mon Monument is the largest in the US. And it has like uh, 583,000 square miles. But in that, there's uh, like 7,000 marine species. In Henoko Uura Bay, this is about 10 square miles, but we have like a 5,300 marine species. So this is very important and a very rich uh, environment. Then why the Japanese government were able to build or have been able to um, push these constructions? One of the reasons is that Japanese government's environmental impact assessment. They conducted environmental impact assessment and they came up with this idea that they came up with the conclusions, there will be no environmental impacts. <laughs> from this construction or operation of the base on the environment. However, various impact have been already observed and studied. And uh, one of the iconic uh, animals, as you can see on this um, the, the picture at the bottom, this uh, the uh, marine mammal, dugons, it's a, uh, you can see, uh, you can think it as the cousin of a manatees in the Florida. The dugons were used to live in this particular area, but now we cannot see. According to the Japanese government's environmental impact assessment, there will be, there should be no impacts on the dugons, but now this dugong is gone. Interestingly, Japanese government admitted the presence of an extremely fragile C4 on this construction site. So again, this tells you that Japanese government's environmental impact assessment was not adequate. So now it's changes in construction design and the enforcement work are necessary. So 72,000 sand impaction piles need to be driven into the sea bottom. That would cause the uh, much uh, more impacts on the environment. And the Japanese government just keeps saying this, there will be no impacts. That's why they were able to proceed with the construction site. But because of this uh, construction, um, that because of the discovery of this fragile seafloor, now the completion date for this base has been moved now it's uh, set in the sum, sometime in 2030s. Original plan was 2022, but now 12 more years. And uh, we were, many Okinawans was wondering now, did the US government know about this fragile C4? Were well, they told about this information? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, forms of, of uh, resistance against the militarism and dual coloni colonialism in Okinawa. Yeah, we have very active uh, local resistance against the uh, militarism and the dual colonialism. We have like sitting protests. It's taken every day actually. Uh, the sitting protests started in 1997 and continues till today. And uh, because now construction's uh, moving ahead and uh, we see uh, on a daily basis, trucks moving into the Camp Schwar, uh, carrying the uh, like a sand and uh, earth and the people trying to block it. Um, so the blockades, uh, we see blockades. And then we have also rallies and uh, elections, uh, referendums, uh, these democratic means that we use to resist this uh, the construction of the base. And uh, also uh, many have filed lawsuits within Japanese uh, legal system, but lawsuits has not been successful actually. Yeah, we've been losing, uh, the government is winning in the, uh, the lawsuits. But I think it's amazing that we were, we have been able to sustain this uh, resistance for more than 20 years. 
and why we resist. I think we have this uh, convictions uh, from the, our experience, our elders' experience of World War II. They were convinced military forces do not protect local people and the communities. And uh, from the experience of having US military bases being built, being uh, used in Okinawa Island for since the uh, World War II, and uh, people realize militarization does not produce a peaceful community and their life. So these are the sort of uh, convictions that based on which our uh, resistance continues today. But in the last 10 years, our movements, resistance movements, also taking another form. We are taking our movements uh, beyond our borders, so to speak. So solidarity with the US society, as you can, uh, Veterans for Peace, of course, and the US environmental NGOs, uh, Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, and the Berkeley Cambridge City Councils. Uh, we are managed to uh, have coalitions or established uh, important relationship in our resistance against the militarism. As you can see on the picture on the top, uh, the person, man sitting and wearing the uh, yellow hood, he's the former mayor of Nago City. As the Veterans for Peace members, you can see this is the uh, hood. Uh, it's a gift provided to him by the Veterans for Peace uh, who are visiting Okinawa and Nago City office a while ago. So the former mayor, whenever we have a gathering, he wears this Veterans for Peace food, showing proudly you know, uh, his commitments to uh, resistance. And uh, we are also working with the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, we were able to get uh, some resolutions passed uh, by the IUCN. And uh, we are also taking the issues to the United Nations Human Rights Council. But the construction is still going. It's very frustrating. And uh, we're just trying to find a way, new ways to fight, or we have to sort of ask, um, place more emphasis or be more strategic in our fights against the uh, militarism and uh, colonialism. And I believe that new visions and the counter narratives are needed against this militarizing narratives of Chinese North Korean threats. So for that, we have like a democracy, just human rights and the indigenous rights. We have to really emphasize that. And we have to emphasize this against this the dual colonialism. And I really hope, and I believe, also believe that we really need to have a concrete actions taking place, not in Japan, only in Japan, but in the US and the international arenas. And uh, hopefully with our Pacific partners and uh, US civil society members like veterans for peace. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hideki. Um, these, thank you all for these very enlightening, if disturbing presentations. It's clear that uh, the uh, US military bases in your countries do not make you safer. In <laughs> fact, they make you targets. And in yes. fact, they cause a lot of uh, destruction to your environment, to your culture, to your health. And uh, it's important that the, the resistance uh, continues and that uh, inter more international solidarity is brought uh, to support you. Um, we uh, have about uh, 15 minutes more. Um, if we want to have a bit of discussion, we don't have a live audience with us today. Uh, this is being pre-recorded. Um, but um, it seems like there, there are some common threads among the struggles that each of your Pacific nations is facing. And I'd be interested to hear about any networks or united efforts among the Pacific Island nations and how you uh, uh, think that uh, people in the United States and around the world 
um, could uh, uh, make a difference uh, in supporting your struggles. Uh, so, um, if you have also, if you have questions for one another or want to have a discussion among one another, this is the time to do that. So, Kyle, uh, we started with you, and I'll, I'll I'll ask you to get the ball rolling again here, if you don't mind. Okay, thanks. Well, I think one. Um, thank you all for those presentations. I learned a lot, even though I thought I knew some stuff. Uh, that was amazing and uh, and frustrating. Uh, it's outrageous the kinds of uh, abuses that are happening, uh, but it's also heartening to see uh, the spirit of the people um, in in struggle with hope, uh, with uh, dignity, and with a vision of a better world. I think we need to have our vision uh, and our um, imagination needs to stretch beyond this kind of Holocaust that we're experiencing right now, this apocalypse. So anyway, I just wanna, uh, one theme that I saw was just the role of the United States in all of this. Um, it is really a US problem that is affecting our region and these local communities. And um, I wanna put it back onto our, our friends and, and supporters uh, and, and people of conscience in the United States uh, that we've got to get, we've got to defund not only the police, but the military uh, and put those resources into um, restoring the environment, restoring health and services for, for communities. Uh, and that means reparations for the, the communities in the Pacific uh, that have been harmed for generations now, you know, um, to feed the, the U.S. war machine. So um, I'd like to, I guess, make an appeal to uh, some of the audience of, of the um, convention, uh, but others who may be watching in the United States that um, definitely Black Lives Matter and we need to defund the police, but it's the same struggle. The, the, the militarization of the police is linked to the militarization that's happening within our region and the kinds of techniques of, of um, militarized control, the kinds of techniques of violence that are being developed and perfected in war zones are now turning back and being used against people in the streets of Portland and Seattle and um, Minneapolis and all these other cities. So it's a real, um, it's a time of um, change, definitely. I think the pandemic is uh, an accelerant that is bringing about uh, conditions where, where things are not stable and that can be an opportunity for change. Uh, I think Arundhati Roy talked about uh, uh, the pandemic being a portal and to uh, have a vision of a different kind of world that could come out of that. And I think too that uh, this, these uprisings that we're seeing are unprecedented. And that's also a huli here. It's, an, uh, it's like a volcano erupting which overturns the earth. And so can we also be part of that and can the U.S. also overturn its uh, um, abusive system uh, and create a, another kind of world where uh, we can have peace and we can have our environments protected and we can have human rights. So that's just a commentary, I guess, my uh, statement. <laughs> um, so Ariana and uh, uh, Malika, I was wondering, um, I know that in some places people are out in the streets or, or sitting down trying to prevent um, further damage by the U.S. military, it sounds like the National Nuclear Commission of the Marshall Islands is taking a little bit different uh, strategy. Are there also people in the Marshall Islands who are out there um, trying to, to get justice in the streets? Um, hi, thank you, Helen. So currently we have well, number one, I must tell everyone that the nuclear legacy was not a part of our education curriculum up until last year. So wow. it wasn't until last year that the, after the NNC was established because they wanted to get it out there. And so last summer we worked with the public school system and the Ministry of Education. And so this year they started piloting the nuclear legacy curriculum. And so I, just wanted to point out that there is a lot of youth that are not aware of our history, including myself. I didn't know much of this until 
I got to UH Manoa and then <laughs> I started writing my papers. And so I decided to do this research on the nuclear legacy because both of my parents are from, my, my father's side is from Wudruk Atoll and my mother is from Rongalab Atoll and their grandparents were there and they experienced the fallout. And so you can see there is a great disconnect in education and when when I go around to the um, schools here and I talk about it, I went to the Marshall Islands High School, which is the high school that has the most students. I think they have 900 students there. It's the public school here. And I asked how many bombs were tested and the most number I got was seven. Our own, our own people don't know that this took place. They don't know that there was more than one bomb. They don't know that it was, you know, it was it took place over its span of not just 12 years but after that with the whole continuation of project 4.1 and taking the samples and they they're not aware of the whole the whole history and so right now what the nnc is really trying to do is to educate educate the youth because then we're losing more and more of our survivors. And so we're also meeting with survivors and you know, making sure we get their um, testimonies on file to be able to share with the students. And um, we, we have a nonprofit organization. They're called the Reach Me, Radiation Exposure Awareness Crusaders uh, for Humanity, Marshall Islands. And they were planning your welcoming if the golden rule was to get here. But, you know, because of coronavirus and everything. But, yeah, so far we have Reach Me and then we have the College of the Marshall Islands Nuclear Club. And most of, most of what's going on now is just educating ourselves first before we, you know, go out there and, like, start to tear this world down with this information. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. But thank you. And, and I really hope that we get there soon so that um, we can meet the people who have reached me. And um, we'll, we can come just as soon as other countries open up to U.S. people and people are allowed to do, you know, small gatherings. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really hoping we can come early next year. Yeah. Yeah, we look forward to having you here. In fact, we invite everybody else here. <laughs> Maria, Kyle, and Hideki. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Uh, well, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to pack uh, all that information into 15 minutes. So I, I uh, apologize for making that uh, such a challenge for all of you, but it was really special having everybody together. Actually, we're, we're thinking seriously about doing some webinars in the coming months that one that would focus only on the Marshall Islands, for example, and include uh, uh, US uh, veterans who are involved in the atomic cleanup there and are also suffering uh, from the effects of radiation. Um, mm -hmm. Maria, I wonder if you have uh, some other words you'd like to share with us, maybe say it, tell us a little bit about the, uh, uh, the, the work of your organization. Sure, yeah, um, we actually, um, like Kyle had mentioned, um, you know, it's just, oh, sorry, my, <laughs> sorry, my son came home with a toy, so he's excited no about problem. it. No problem, let's see the toy. <laughs> well, um, basically, our organization, um, or, or just going back to Kyle, um, you had mentioned, um, you know, you learned a lot more about what's been, what's, uh, been taking place. And I think I, I try to stay up to date too with a lot of the issues mentioned here today, but just to hear it from a personal place from, you know, from like, you know, people actually experiencing these injustices is it just, um, you know, it's, it's hard, it's, even more heartbreaking to hear it from a personal perspective. I mean, it was already heartbreaking, but just to hear it, um, hear you guys speak about it, um, it really, uh, it was really hard for me to hear all of that. Um, so actually, um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that our organization, Pritahi Texan, we actually have, um, uh, worked with Okinawan groups in the past. Uh, we've hosted a few 
um, organizations from Okinawa to do some outreach here to spread spread um, information about what's going on um, out there. No Helipad to Kai is one of them. Okay. We, we actually right. had, yeah, it was so nice to have them here. Um, and we held a, a, a movie showing and an outreach event and just educated the community about us, how, you know, some of the issues out there are facing there with the deforestation and um, impacts to endangered species as well. Um, and uh, also, it's, it's interesting, Ariana, that you mention um, how the effects of colonialism aren't really taught in schools there, and it's kind of the same issue for us here. I was not aware of a lot of the impacts um, about the, uh, just a, a lot of the injustices until ad adulthood as well. And, um, you know, it's just not, we, we learn like American history, we're, we're kind of shifting from that to, um, we have a superintendent who's, who's really interested in having more of our culture being taught in schools. But um, for the most part, like for me, like growing up my generation, we just were taught US history and and never about the injustices. So in college, I think it was the first I, I was really hearing about um, the insular cases and you know just the, the racism that our, our people experience. But I was still kind of in this bubble of thinking, oh well, you know, the US, they can't. I mean, they're they they're I was taught that they were actually the good guys, you know, like um, I, I didn't really it didn't really register. Um, the racism involved until later, um, until I, I took more political science courses. And yeah, so that definitely needs to change. I think it's a systemic issue that maybe we're seeing in not just our areas, but in so many others. And um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that, that, that we're kind of, we experience the same thing where I, I'm, I went through the exact same thing that you're going through, just my mind being blown about all the injustices and just just with that it's kind of like the glass shatters and you can't just you can't shut up about it anymore because you you just have to keep moving forward and doing what's best for your people so i think that's what we're all doing here today and just to really appreciate um all of you sharing your perspectives so that we can grow in that way that's great thank you so much maria hideki i'm kind of interested in your uh uh, environmental focus. You know, it seems like a lot of people uh, are saying now that we we're, humanity faces two existential crises. And one is the actually growing threat of nuclear war, uh, which we should be much more concerned about. Many more people are aware of climate change as a, as a big and growing and imminent threat that's already uh, causing much destruction. But um, only recently has the environmental movement here in the United States begun to talk about the impact of military and militarism on climate change and, and the environment overall. Um, it's been kind of a blind spot. Uh, it's kind of a, something that people were, were conditioned not to talk about, not only in the United States, but even at the United Nations. So. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear, hear a few more words from you, Hideki, about uh, the, uh, the, the um, connection between militarism and militarization and climate change. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Um, so here in Okinawa, we've been experiencing uh, lots of, I think, impacts from the climate change, you know, this year, usually every year we have a typhoons coming to Okinawa in July. Now we expect that, but this year no typhoons, which is not really good actually, <laughs> because the typhoon comes, the typhoons sort of uh, clean up the uh, ocean, so to speak, so that you know it's the uh, revive the all the uh, the ocean and all the creatures. But climate change is being, I think, uh, affecting many parts of the uh, the world, and um. I think I want to just uh, mention that, as, as Jerry said, in, in, in Okinawa, uh, we've been uh, engaged in this anti-military basis uh, uh, construction move, movement for a while. But actually, it's recently, in the last 15 years or so, that 
we shifted into the environmental front. One of the reasons is that because um, like we have like a US uh, environmental NGOs that who are able to support us. So the shift into the environmental direction is in a way it's a kind of strategic uh, decisions. Thank you, Hideki. Hello? Well, I'd like to thank again, um, Kyle Kajihiro of Hawaii, Ariana Tibon and Malika Andrique of the Marshall Islands, Maria Hernandez of Guahan, and Hideki Yoshikawa from Okinawa. And we really look forward to visiting all of you when the Golden Rule is allowed to sail to your islands. And thank you for joining this uh, webinar with Veterans for Peace. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, everyone. It was terrific. We'll do it again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank